I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. All of us leave a legacy behind. We'll be remembered for something. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, in two verses, we have an amazing legacy of one man. Not something that he accomplished per se, but his prayer is what blesses us there. First Chronicles 4, I want to read verse nine, verses 9 and 10. A very familiar prayer. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. And now this is his legacy. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. Very familiar, well-known prayer often preached on. We won't be going into all the details this morning, but what blesses me is here is a prayer that's basically the main thing, pretty well the only thing we know about this man. And what's the highlight of this is, and God heard his prayer. That tells us that his prayer, the content of that prayer was spoken with sincerity. It was spoken according to the will of God, and God answered it. And we want to take a portion of that prayer as, and bore that as our title, Lord, expand our territory. Help us to grow. I think we resonate with this prayer, when, especially when we think about our spiritual life, we want to advance. We resonate with this prayer when we think about our congregation as well, speaking very practically, Lord, expand our territory. Help us to grow. And the question comes, how can this take place? Here is a prayer. God answered, God granted. We don't know exactly how in his life. But how can a church, a congregation grow? is the question that I pondered and asked and studied in the Word of God. And you know, I had to think of the concept of planting flowers. When we go and buy seeds, there's seed or even little pre-planted plants. There's always a little piece of paper or a little thing that is stuck in the dirt, and it tells us the condition in which this plant, this flower, does best. Full sun, or full shade, or a bit of both. And it tells us this plant can exceed if those conditions are right. So what are the things that the Word of God outlines, the things that we see in God's Word that enables us to grow? We can apply it spiritually to our own life and also as a congregation. As we will see like gardening, growing, growth does not come automatically. There is a lot, of, a lot involved. And the first thing that we, I want to stress and highlight is God wants His church to grow. He made that very clear when just before He left earth, he ascended to heaven and he told his disciples in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's your territory. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Expanding the territory. Go and take it. God wants to do it and he uses people to accomplish it. You know, I have to think of an example in the Old Testament where God made a promise to the Israelites and says, Land of Canaan, that is my promise to you. 
That is your territory. But they still had to obey God's leading, obey God's command, and conquer that territory. And also, in the Old Testament, God says, this will be your territory from there to there. And from there to there. That's your territory. Restricted. The rest was for the people, the nations around them. Here, God says the territory, the scope of the gospel is the world. That is the territory that God wants his message to reach everyone. In Joshua 1 verse 2, there we read how God told Joshua, you go now and claim that territory. Church Joshua 1 verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all his people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. God's promise, God's will, but they had to obey. And there was battles to be fought. There was decisions to be made. There were sacrifices to be to take into an account. But God said, that's my promise. Claim it. Use it. So God wants his message to spread. His, he wants his church to grow globally. He wants soul to, souls to be saved. And the question is, are we willing to do what it takes? Are we willing to take that step? Like a Joshua said, you go across that Jordan, you go claim that land. We also, having underlined that, that there's a prayer, God wants it, and there's something that we do in order to be part of this. Before we get to that, though, we need to also stress and highlight that Jesus is the one that is building the church. It is his. We have no authority of changing the design, if you will, spiritually, the core. We have the option of going off on our own tangent, but then we're not part of his work anymore. Then we're doing our own work. Jesus is building his church. That is what he said in, to Peter. And to his disciples, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we get to be part of that. And so the main focus, first and foremost, is to allow Jesus to be the master builder. Not to take it into our own hands. Because without him, we can't do anything. John 15, 4 and 5, he stresses it. This is a different context, but we can certainly apply this when it speaks of of building and expanding. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. The kingdom of God will be expanded. For without me you can do nothing. God wants to, Jesus is, and he wants to use us as he is building the church. We can be sidetracked and try to do things in our own strength. And you know, as I remember one pastor once saying, it's amazing how much we can accomplish in the flesh, at least in our appearance. You can gather a big crowd, perhaps. But Jesus has to be at the core. That is essential. See, not all good ideas are God's will. And that is, I think, where it's so complicated. And that is where it's so important for us to remain open to The speaking of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that there was a time or there were times and places where the Holy Spirit 
forbid the apostles to preach the gospel? Did you know that? Acts 16, let me read, verses 6 to 9. Acts 16, 6 to 9. And this underlines the importance of us listening to God. Jesus is building, we are following his direction through the Holy Spirit. Acts 16, 6 to 9. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Sarda sounds contrary, right? But not that time, not that place. After they had come to Mercia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Again, they're not here. So passing by Mercia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the, in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. God directed through the Spirit. He says, not here, not now. Not here, not now. There is an open door. There is a man who's been praying, who's been fasting. He's waiting for the message. And the Apostle Paul had an open ear. And he obeyed that call. See, that is how Jesus can build his church. The early church grew and was successful only because they had an open ear. To the leading of the Holy Spirit. Find ample examples of that in, in the book of Acts. We find that they were praying and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit spoke. Take Barnabas and Saul. I have a, a mission for them. He is building the church. And we are following. We are leading. Open ears is, are essential. Another thing that we have to keep in mind when we think of expanding the territory, as we notice, is a complex thing. Based on the emphasis that the apostles put, purity comes before expansion. While we pray to expand, but the purity of it of the church goes before the mass numbers. In Luke 14, we have Jesus talking about the good salt and the bad salt. And it's, what good is it if we have a whole pile of salt that has lost its flavor? We have a big pile, but it's useless. If we have a little bit that is, still has its flavor, it's more value than a big pile. So purity is, comes before expansion or before a mass number of it. The goal, the aim of the apostles was just that. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, here we have a description. He makes a connection to a husband loving his wife like Christ loved the church. But then he, we also see what kind of a church Jesus is after. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. We notice that's his emphasis. The emphasis is not, get me the biggest number you can get. While that is a goal, let's reach every soul. But the first emphasis is purity before expansion, before quality, before quantity, if you will. And that is why I think there's a strong argument for the statement that is made, focus more on church health than church growth. Because if the, I personally believe if there, the church is healthy, not always, depending on the, the, the society, obviously, but there will be at least inside eternal, internal growth, and they will not be stagnant if the church is healthy. But there can be growth without church health if that growth is not orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. 
And Jesus had very strong words to a group of people that were very zealous about reaching people. Converting them. But they converted them to something that was useless. Matthew 23, verse 15. And Jesus talks very open. He leaves no room for doubt what he means. Matthew 23, verse 15, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. Proselyte is a heathen that was converted to a Jew. You travel land and sea to convert one. And when he is one, you've made him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Strong words. Zeal? Yes, there was. Sacrifice? They traveled land and sea. Outcome? A son of hell, using the words of Jesus. Duplicating a mistake does not make it right. The focus is on genuine relationship with God, first and foremost. And then, expand on that, build on that, in that spirit-driven outreach to the soul. The purity in our own lives. And that is why it is so critical for you and for me as we interact with people, that there is that purity in our life. That after we've interacted with a person, we can invite them to church and they would not say, no, I'm not going there. First Peter 2, verse 12, it says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Why? That when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in a day of visitation. Purity comes before expansion. A health of the church, and that comes from pure heart. Much so much could, more could be said on that, built on that. God wants to build a church. He wants to. Jesus is doing it. He is focusing on purity first before expansion, and then... There is no growth without effort. No growth without effort. There's no shortcut that we can take. Sometimes it's nice, especially as a pastor, I catch myself thinking, man, what's that one program or that one thing we could do that would just make this thing up? That's not how it works. Only dandelions and weeds grow by themselves. But the plants that we want, the ones that bring fruit, those are the ones that take care. And some of you are what they call, you have a green thumb and you're good at it. I'm, I'm not good at really caring for plants that are hard to care for. But without effort, there is no growth. And you know, sometimes we read about the events in the early church and we, at least I, I catch myself thinking, man, that was great. Wouldn't it have been nice to be part of that early church where there was expansion, there was multiplication. But do we ever zoom out a little bit and look at the, activity of the activities of the individual people? They were working. They were active in their daily life. They worked, they were persecuted, they were scattered, they had to leave their homes, but they kept working. And the Apostle Paul, he writes, gives a testimony of what the fruit that we see now and we read of and say the Apostle Paul really used, was used by God. We see what it, it cost him, the effort that he had to put in by the grace of God in order to make that possible. Second Corinthians 6, verse 4 to 6 Listen to all the things that the Apostle Paul took on himself so that the kingdom of God could be expanded. I'll read it from a different translation this morning. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 4. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. 
we patiently endure troubles and hardships, calamities of every kind. We've been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry moms, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by the purity, again we have the emphasis on purity of our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. Effort. That is what he said, that's what it's cost me. That's what I've gone through as I'm working, obeying God's call to expand the kingdom of God. Again, there will be no shortcut for growth in the congregation here in Bahia. As much as we would love it. We need God, we need the Holy Spirit, and it will take effort on my part and on all of our part. There's no shortcut. What we hold in our hand today, the Bible, is stained with the sweat, the tears, and the blood of the brothers and sisters before us, beginning with the apostles, beginning with Christ, rather. The only way that the kingdom of God can expand. As the saying goes, the door of opportunity hinges on opposition. And that, to overcome that, takes grace, power from above, and effort on our behalf. And there's a proverb, 14 verse 4, it's become dear to me, it's an, an encouragement. It reminds me that we could choose to do nothing, then it would be a lot easier, but then there's no, no growth. Proverbs 14 verse 4, it says, Where's, where no oxen are, the trough is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Different translation says, Without oxen, a stable stays clean, but you need a strong ox for a large harvest. And the implication is, yo, you don't want to have the effort of cleaning that trough all the time, then just don't have an ox. But then if you don't have an ox, you can't plow that field. You can't bring, that har bring in that harvest. It takes effort on our behalf. Everyone is included in that. You know what, I know statistics are statistics. You can probably use them to prove almost anything. But they, I don't know exactly how they arrived at this conclusion, but they asked people for the reason of why or what motivated them to come to, that, to, a, to church. One percent joined because there was a special revival meeting. Just one. 2% because of a general visitation by the pastor. In other words, the pastor did cold, cold calls and invited and talked to people and knocked on the doors, and 2% said that's why they came. 4% joined because of some special or unique need that they had. 6% just walked in on their own. Another 6% because the church had a good pastor. 7% because of a good Sunday school. In other words, a children's ministry. 10% joined because good programs for children and adults. Now here, 65% joined because they were invited by a friend, relative, or coworker. 65%. Now you may think, well, isn't good, good for you to say you're pushing the blame on us. No, I'm just as responsible to reach my neighbors as you are. The people that I am in contact with. The people that we are already in connection with, build trust with. Those are the people that we have opportunity to reach out. Sometimes it can take years. I just talked recently to someone who said he had the opportunity prayed someone, his kids are practicing on the soccer field, and he was sitting there talking with the parents, and I prayed with someone. But he said it took years of just talking everyday things and then slowly introducing the gospel. That's, that's what it takes. Everyone is gifted differently with different approaches, and we'll get to that later. 
But I also read about Charles Spurgeon, who was so well known. He was preaching over to over 5,000 people every Sunday in the London Tabernacle Church. And they once asked him, point blank, he says, how did you get such a big congregation? He says, I didn't. My congregation got the congregation. What he said was, you asked me how I got this congregation? I never got it at all. My congregation got my congregation. I had 80 when I first preached. In short time, I had 20, or 200, sorry. Everyone in the congregation was urging a neighbor to come to the service. As soon we had 400 and then 800. This is how our people got our congregation. Now, obviously, this is relative to the place that you live in. The amount of people that you come in contact with or you can invite. But my daily interaction, your daily interaction, is the most effective outreach tool that we've been given. And you know, much, many people, maybe f for you it might be hard to believe, but many people would much rather talk to their friend or coworker about their trouble than to come to the pastor. Because there's, there's a sense of familiarity. I've literally had that where someone, and not here, but different place, of someone new came, they had questions. They said, well, hey, let's go talk to the pastor. No, no, no. I, don't, I just want, I feel more comfortable talking with you. So there's an opportunity to, to talk with people. Getting involved in the neighbor and the people around us, our lives. Getting to know them, their names, not just walking by. Friendships that are built, ties and trust. We all have a part in that, winning the soul. And in saying that, God uses very different methods to the end. And I know this word methods is, how should I say it, a bit of a raw nerve perhaps, because you can abuse it in both ways. On one hand, you could change the method so much that you miss the point altogether. On the other hand, you can be so rigid about the method that we've always used that the Holy Spirit can't use you to, um, in a different, you use a different approach. The fact is, if you read about the conversion stories in the Bible, ever thought about how different God went about it? Peter gets up and preaches one sermon. People are cut to the heart. 3,000 of them are saved. That's how we want to do it. It's not how it worked for Paul. He was on his way to Damascus. God stopped him. That's not how it worked for the eunuch who was on his way home. He had been in Jerusalem. He's all by himself, reading, a heart longing. Holy Spirit said, Philip, there's a soul that needs you. And he went. That's not how, how it happened for the jailer at Philippi. It happened at work for him. His workplace happened to be the jail. He was the jailer. He said, what must I do? These two men of God said, repent and be saved. How it happened, that's how it happened for them, or for him, him and his household. Others, to this day, there's, God uses so many different, different approaches, methods, visions, miracles sometimes. But the key thing is the methods always have to, have to, have to come back to the foot of the, foot of the cross, repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. God, as I said, used very unlikely methods sometimes. There's so many stories that intrigue me and encourage me, frankly. Just want to share one that stuck with me. I year, read it years ago. There was a young man who had turned his back on God, grew up in a Christian home, knew about God, 
And his mother kept asking, son, please come. Sometimes he'd come, sometimes he wouldn't. And one night he finally said, okay, mom, I'm going to come one more time with the condition that you'll never bug me about coming to church again. Of course, the mother's heart sank. But with agony in her heart, she agreed. Okay, I won't. They went to church, and the young man told himself, I'm not going to pay attention to what the pastor says. Not going to listen. And he didn't. He was looking around at the architecture, at how it was built and how the people behaved. And then he noticed there was a light fixture similar to ours, except for that one had four lights. Ours is three, but that one had four. And he saw hmm, one light bulb is burnt out. He thought to himself, hmm, someone should have changed that. And before he knew it, the pastor said, Amen. They sang the final hymn and he walked out the door. He did not have a clue what the pastor preached about that day. That evening. But during the night, all of a sudden, that son wakes up the mom. Says, what's wrong? I've got to give my heart to Jesus. She was stunned. What happened? She says, you know, during that service, I sat there and I looked at that light fixture. Three burning, one burned out. Father, mother, and my sister. They're all a, a lot burned Burning alive for Jesus. Or, sorry, they're lit up for Jesus. One in our family is dead. That's me. I've got to change that. He knew. He knew the stories. She says, Mom, can you pray with me? God uses circumstances, things that we would never expect. So don't discredit when you can't maybe do it like so and so. Or like, I want to say don't even try it to do it like so and so. Just ask God to give you opportunities to just love the people and where possible, share. Just one sentence at a time sometimes maybe. God can use these little things. I also am touched by the story on the, of the thief on the cross. The thief in agony and based on how we re recognize Jesus, we know that he knew, once I die, this isn't over. Glaring hell into the face. But then he looked over, and all he said was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was enough for Jesus. If I can be very frank, he didn't say, Lord, I repent of my sins. The exact wording that we encourage people to say, I'm not saying we shouldn't encourage that. But a heart that was crying out, acknowledging him as Savior, begging for grace. Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise today. And that is, I think, the reason why... Jesus also said in Matthew 7, verse 16, you will know them by their fruit. You'll know who are my children by their fruit. Not by did they do this process just like this. Had, did their encounter with God change them? To be in line with the word of God. Know them by their fruit. Changed forever. Lord, expand our territory. God, we know you want to. And Jesus, you have to build it. Help us to listen to your voice when, as you guide us. And Lord, give us the strength not to just sit back because it, we know it will take effort to expand. It always has and it always will. That prayer one more time applied to us. Oh, that you would bless us indeed and enlarge our territory and that your hand would be with us 
and that you would keep us from evil and that we may not cause pain. May God help us as we continue to ponder on it. May God help us to see the opportunities and make use of them. Wouldn't that be amazing? Not to take the credit, but when we get to heaven, for their soul to be there, thanks for that testimony you shared. That's why I'm here. We can do that with God's grace. May God help us. Amen.